This is the calm before the storm. It's the whole world versus a virus. Look, this is serious, you know. We must declare war on this virus. Welcome to World vs. Virus, a podcast from the World Economic Forum that aims to make sense of the COVID-19 outbreak. Every week, we plan to bring you expert advice and analysis of the global crisis and what can be done to fix it. This is a time for prudence, not panic. Science, not stigma. Facts, not fear. It's Friday, March the 20th. I'm Robin Pomeroy, Digital Editor at the World Economic Forum. In this episode of World vs. Virus, We'll hear from a leading global economist on why the impact of COVID-19 is likely to be even worse than the 2008 financial crisis. During the global financial crisis, it took uh, almost two years until the stock market was down 30%. Now it's taken less than a month. And an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy gives tips on how we can all protect our mental health from the risks posed by the outbreak. It is now about practicing working on what I can control and not trying to control stuff that's out of my reach. But first, let's have a roundup of where things stand. Now I'm joined by Linda Lacina from the World Economic Forum's New York office, although she's at home, as am I, uh, because we're all in some form of quarantine or another. Um, Linda, you're going to look at the World Economic Forum's coverage of COVID-19 over the last week and pick out our top three stories. I should just say for the listeners, it's Thursday evening in Geneva, afternoon in New York. So this may have moved on. It's moving so quickly, this story. But give us the first of your top three for the week. Sure. Uh, The most important, I think, is that we reached some really key milestones as far as where the cases are. Uh, China reported uh, Thursday that there's no new locally transmitted cases, and also Italy's death rate has overtaken China's. And why that's important is that the epicenter of the disease has moved. It means that China's very aggressive efforts to suppress the disease have been successful. And it also gives uh, other folks hope that uh, there can be good changes with um, doing comprehensive efforts. And so uh, the other thing that uh, this leads to, of course, is that uh, there could be transmission from outsiders and uh, lead to uh, perhaps a- another outbreak. As they wrote in the uh, China Daily this week, uh, a single spark can uh, start a prairie fire. And so uh, currently, um, anybody who is uh, coming in from outside the country is being asked to quarantine. But uh, In China, they are sort of returning to some sort of normalcy, which is maybe a little bit heartening for the rest of us that um, there there can be uh, some hope. Right. This is the big test, isn't it? The whole world watched Wuhan in China right at the start. Then the attentions moved slightly to Europe and to North America. Um, And now we're looking back on China because once again, they're showing us where we might be in a few weeks time. Should we move on to your number two pick of our coverage? Yeah, I think the other really important thing this week is that there have been some really key um, strategy shifts uh, from uh, some countries. And a lot of this is um, after a special report that was done by the Imperial College COVID-19 response team. And um, it it actually sparked changes in strategies by the UK and the US. Uh, Both became a little bit more aggressive this week in sort of the UK asking workers to stay home. They uh, just closed schools. The US has been Uh, recommending that people avoid groups of 10 or less, also work from home. Uh, They're working to bridge equipment shortages. So the the types of efforts uh, have changed entirely. And the reason why this is important and why that report was so important is that it showed uh, sort of different scenarios and the impact of, say, um, doing maybe nothing or the um, impact of sort of doing uh, different suppression techniques. And what they found is that suppression will be a lot more um, uh, powerful than mitigation. And suppression is uh, the comprehensive package of uh, measures that uh, the the WHO has been advocating for. Uh, Folks haven't been on the briefings like I have all week. Um, Those include things like social distancing, isolation, quarantine, testing. And so um, those are all really, really important. And so if all those measures are taken, then um, you'll be able to to control the disease. So that uh, that report really helped change a lot of minds and, and is helping to sort of drive new strategies um, across the world. Yes, and I think we can take a listen to the Secretary General of the World Health Organization, who uh, said this in a briefing earlier this week. You cannot fight a fire blindfolded. 
And we cannot stop this pandemic if we don't know who is infected. We have a simple message for all countries. Test, test, test. And that was the head of the World Health Organization just across the lake from me in Geneva, Dr. Tedros, saying test, test, test. And that seems to, well, I don't know whether it's from the WHO or from that Imperial College London study that you mentioned, Linda, something changed the policies there in a couple of very big countries. Well, one very big one, yours, and one medium-sized one, mine, the United Kingdom. Okay, what's your third and final pick of the week story? Uh, some good news. Uh, some good news is that uh, there have been some pretty promising and helpful developments about researchers uh, from all around the world coming together for solutions, much needed solutions. One of them, and this is uh, from the briefing yesterday that the WHO put together, the World Health Organization. One is that there's uh, the first vaccine trial uh, was announced this week, and that's uh, pretty impressive. It's just 60 days after the gen genetic sequence was uh, shared by China, and that's uh, um, an international effort. And then the other thing that's really um, uh, impressive is that there's a thing called the solidarity trial that was announced. And that is um, a, a study that was organized by the World Health Organization where um, untested treatments can be compared with each other. And it's a way to sort of share data and to find out which treatments are the most effective. They're basically combining resources rather than having a lot of people do a lot of very small studies where the methodologies sort of uh, don't really line up with each other and it's not very effective or efficient. And so this is really helpful. And again, it's just a, an uh, opportunity to show how um, uh, different countries are working together and um, pooling uh, everyone's uh, intellectual uh, uh, capital, and it can be really powerful. Still, a solution is a long way off, but it, um, there were some interesting developments with that, and I think that that's um, promising and heartening for everyone who might be uh, uh, quarantined in their home like myself or like you. Or, or anyone who might be listening to this pretty much, I would think. Okay, great, Linda. Thanks very much. Nouriel Roubini is one of the world's most prominent economists. He's a professor at New York University Stern School of Business and chairman and chief executive officer of Roubini Macro Associates. He famously predicted the financial crisis in 2008 and says this will be far worse. He also has some sage advice for policymakers. He was speaking to my colleague Max Hall. If we're thinking about the economic uh, impact of this coronavirus, um, I must say that probably we have not seen something like this uh, before. It looks very different. And I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. Uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, the crisis was severe, but it took about uh, two years from the time where you had the unraveling of the US housing market and mortgages until we got uh, the collapse of Lehman. Uh, and then things got much worse. This time around, we've had economic activity like consumption, residential investment, retail sales, uh, and uh, production and capital spending collapsing sharply in a matter of few weeks. Uh, during the global financial crisis, it took uh, almost two years until the stock market was down 30%. Now it's taken less than a month. And even if you compare this with the Great Depression, the Great Depression started in 1929 with a stock market crash, but the depth of the Great Depression started only in 1932-33. So initially it was a stock market crash, and then the mistaken response to it led it to become the Great Depression. So this is just something we've not really seen before. People use this metaphor, is this a V-shaped recession? Is it U-shaped? Is it L-shaped? Is it I-shaped? Is an I, it's like a stick, dropping down very sharply, uh, as for example, even some of the Wall Street firm now say that in the second quarter of this year in the US, economic activity may be falling at the annual rate of uh, say 15%, when even the White House advisor is saying the unemployment rate could sharply go up uh, from the current 3.5% to more than 20%. It's a bit like as if, uh, an asteroid at the ether the hurt, and not just one economy or the other. Sometimes we have a recession in the US, but not in Asia, or one in China, but not in Europe. Right now, pretty much every region in the world has uh, gone into a free fall of economic activity. So it's unprecedented in the speed, 
in the depth and into the global reach of it. So this is something much more severe than we've seen before. That was economist Noriel Rubini talking to the World Economic Forum. We've all heard the risk the virus poses to our physical health, but what's the impact on our mental health? My colleague Max Hall is here. Hi Max, how are you feeling? Hi Robin, I'm well, thanks for asking. I'm at home with my wife and son. We're all in good spirits, but I know that there are many others out there who are experiencing a lot of anxiety. And you've looked into anxiety, and what have you learned? Earlier, I got the chance to speak with Margaret Curran. She's a leading expert in cognitive behavioural therapy and helps children, adolescents and adults who find themselves suffering from negative thinking patterns to change their lives. I asked her about the toll the virus is taking on people's mental health. First of all, it's anxiety. Um, and for those who have an underlying anxiety issue, um, something like this just blows it out of the water. Because anxiety comes from a fear of being out of control and unable to tolerate the uncertainty of not knowing. And we are absolutely in the height of that now. Um, so that that's rooted in, you know, where people are, are constantly ruminating about what it is they don't know and waiting for something bad normally to happen. So um, anxiety would be the, the, the number one thing that I'm seeing. I think as it goes on, um, we could find a lot more people, uh, more people suffering with depression because there's a kind of a hopelessness can come in. If I feel, you know, my life is not going as I thought it would, uh, various things are happening, possibly losing my job, possibly losing a loved one. Um, there, there can creep in a real sense of hopelessness. I also asked if it reminded her of other psychological conditions. Well, I mean, it's very like people who, I mean, people who go to war and who are on front line will, will be dealing with this kind of thing all of the time, um, which is constant uncertainty. And, you know, that triggers a certain response in them all the time and they, they can end up with PTSD. And so post for them, post-traumatic, yeah, stress, post-traumatic disorder, yeah. stress disorder. So, for for some people, this is not this would not be new if they've been on front line um, dealing with uncertainty. That is serious. Are there groups of people she's concerned about? Yes, there are. Here's Margaret again. Well, first of all, those who've had underlying anxiety issues um, before this kicked off are are you know they're very vulnerable at the moment. Um, you know, vulnerability in terms of their mental health would be those who have other underlying mental health issues, like um, people who have OCD in particular would be um, really uh, uh, finding it very, very challenging at the moment. Elderly people who are feeling quite isolated anyway without this, who possibly live on their own, who are very lonely, um, they are also a very vulnerable group. Um, And I think health professionals who are working very, very long hours are at a higher increase of having burnout um, and the exhaustion that can go with that. Are you also worried about children, young adolescents and families? Most definitely. And 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 as I said, if the if the child had an anxious disposition in the first place, um, they have a lot of questions, and you know we can be over flooded with um, with news, and again, not necessarily the most reliable news. And if you have a parent in a house who's quite anxious that is inclined to rub off on the child in terms of they can pick up on that anxiety, they can pick up on that uncertainty. And children can create scenarios in their own head. Like they're very good, as I said, of, of, at making movies. And so it's important that they would get some information without being overloaded with information. And that, that there's a sense in a house of reasonable calm um, where there isn't a frantic Um, search for knowledge and a constant updating on how many people in, you know, in Italy have died today and how many people in Switzerland have gotten the uh, contact, contracted the virus. All of that in a household just adds to the levels of anxiety and especially for children. 
So, Max, does she have any advice for parents? Well, she said that children are very much looking for reassurance. It's very good to give it, but not to constantly do it, as children need to learn how to reassure themselves, as that's key for good resilience and mental health for the future. Here's Margaret again. So it is giving them information um, without overloading the information, having a realistic perspective on it, you know, not catastrophizing, as there's quite a bit of in the media. It's being reality based um, and answering the questions that they would have. And then if it's a constant where they're constantly coming back to you looking for more and more reassurance, you've got to remind them, remember what mom said to you earlier. What did mom say to you earlier about that? So that the child starts to learn to reassure itself. So that's children. And what's your advice for adults? Well, there are a few things. One of the big things is to keep your routine.